Thanks for joining us today. At City Life, we have one purpose, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. We believe today's message will empower you to do exactly that. But remember that church is so much more than a sermon you listen to. It's a living, breathing community that we invite you to be a part of. We hope to see you on a Sunday morning at City Life. On the mountain, in the valley, in the crowded streets, or the empty desert, in our hope, and in our waiting, we are never alone. God is with us. My name is Jennifer Blackwood, and I am not usually here, although you guys are always part of my family. We are a family. We just have an extended room in West Edmonton Mall. You know, I really enjoy shopping, and I really enjoy movies, and I love church, so I get to do all three every Sunday if I want to. So if you haven't finished your Christmas shopping, you can come visit us next Sunday for service at 10 a.m. at the Scotiabank Theater, and you can finish up your last minute things. It might be crazy. I'm not, I'm not saying it's gonna be a walk in the park, but it will be festive and fun, which is a lot of things in this season, I'm sure. You're just like, yeah, this is fun. You gotta tell yourself, it is good. It will be good. Yes, and today we are making history in this building because next week you probably will be looking at a much larger stage in a different lit room. Yeah, is that awesome? And it's going to be my handsome husband up here. My Jeremy is going to preach. So exciting. And we get to continue this series of God with us. You know, in this season, he is with us even now. No matter what, he is here and in your season, in your life, and wants to be in there for the long haul with you. And the, the basis of this series is on a scripture from the Bible in Matthew 1.23, where it says that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. And the beauty of this story of Christmas is that God is not just a God somewhere out there. He was, he's not just distant and removed from our lives. He actually came to be with us, which is so powerful. And that's what actually differentiates even Christianity from a lot of other world religions, is we don't just check off rules. We don't just serve. We don't just do this, 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 and this to measure up and worship a God, we actually have a God who wanted to move into the neighborhood, is what one translation says. He wanted to be with us, and that is so powerful and should inspire you that, man, I am not here on my own, but I am here with purpose. And even now, in your season, God is with you. Whether you're experiencing a season of great abundance and victory, or one of desperation and lack, God is with you and with us. And we have this awesome opportunity to gather this morning and be able to get some of what God wants to build into us in this season. Last week, and I will, yeah, I would take drinks of water and it would be like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, as with the microphone and chairs like you got to not do that so I'm gonna try not do that but I might forget just so you know but when we gather in this space together it's not just an information session it's not this is not a classroom like you know the teacher and the students No, this is a family and we're actually getting together gathering around God's Word to be able to build into our lives so that we can do Monday well and we can make our week different because we gathered because we came because we heard his message and it transforms us it changes us I can't do that 
but he can. You know, we have connect groups and, and small groups, people who get together. Maybe it's driving in the car on the way home from church with your spouse, and you just talk about something that stood out to you so that it actually drops from your head into your heart and actually changes the way you do life. We have our next steps class that we do again to discuss things and to answer questions and figure things out deeper. I mean, if I were to give this section hammers for Christmas, oh, you're so happy. Alan would be so happy. And and this this section, I give you all bags and nails. And this section, I give you, you know, big two by fours. Really, if you don't get together and figure out what tools you all got, you're not gonna be able to build anything. So the goal is, is that this is just the starting point of being able to build it into our lives to change and build our house, build our spirits. And this morning we are talking about God is with us in the dark. And we've been talking about the wilderness seasons, the storm seasons, the valleys, and the challenges that sometimes we find ourselves in where it's like, God, where are you? Why, why is this happening? And we've been so encouraged in this series, or I have, just hearing how God actually shows and reveals himself to us in these seasons. You know, it's hard to experience light when you don't know what dark is. When you've never been in the dark, if you step into the light, you actually would not appreciate it if you just live in the light all the time. Now, darkness by definition is actually the absence of light. So it's actually the opposite of light. But light by definition, which I think is so cool, is the natural agent that stimulates sight and makes things visible. So that means we need the light of the world to stimulate our sight, our spiritual sight, to see things that we could not see before, to actually make things visible that we did not know were there. And Jesus is that light. He is the light of the world. He illuminates stuff even in our darkness so that we can see. It's like when you're camping in, on, in Alberta in the middle of the night and you're just like, oh, I got to go make, it to the, make a trip to the outhouse. If you don't have a flashlight, you're going to be like tripping over potholes and probably end up in a ditch because it's, it's, there's some rough territory out there, those campsites. It's like, whoa. So having that light helps to illuminate your path so that you can actually bypass some of those challenges. If you were at work one day and all the power went out, all the lights went out, you would probably not stay there all day. Because the reality is, is that you can't get a job done if you can't see, if you can't, can't get, you know, get, use your hands and use your, your whatever you, to make the job come together, you need to be able to see. And God has given us, you know, Jesus came to us and he, it was so powerful because he was really a nobody from nowhere. And yet there is multiple stories and eyewitnesses, account, eyewitness accounts of his life that were actually taken record of, which is amazing because in that time period, you would have to be a very wealthy person, a very important person to ever have anyone record what you did. So the fact that we have multiple accounts of Jesus and his life on the planet can encourage us and remind us that this word is true. It's historically proven. It's credible. You can actually gain wisdom and not just information, but actually spiritual wisdom, things that actually change and transform you. It's a living word, and it's so powerful that we get to utilize it. And so today we're actually going to look at one of the stories of when Jesus was on the planet and something super cool that he did because he did lots of super cool things. And it's in John chapter 11, and it's the story of Lazarus. I'm going to show that part of the recording to Jer. Be like, look, look, I did it. And he'll be like, yeah, you made it really obvious, though. That's awkward. Um, <laughs> but I did it, so I'm listening, doing well. So the story of Lazarus is actually a story of The Walking Dead. I don't know if you've seen The Walking Dead series. I sure haven't. I don't watch scary things. But 
this is a real story. It really happened of a guy who was like dead, totally dead, utter darkness, in a tomb, no skylight. They didn't pay extra to get chisel and skylights in that time period. And so he was in complete darkness and was pulled out of that darkness by the light of the world. It's an amazing story and we are going to kind of walk our way through it today to be able to encourage us that man, you know, we have the light of the world inside of us. We have a breakthrough even when we don't see it. So we're going to jump into this story. And it's an incredible story because we actually get to see how, you know, God or Jesus was fully God and fully man. And we get to see some of his actual emotions, the way that he lived and how he experienced life as we experience it with friendships, with death, with sorrow, with joy, with tears. He experienced these things. We don't have a God who cannot relate with us because he came to be with us and actually understand and, and live perfectly so that we could see how to live. It's so powerful. And this morning, I have two, this afternoon, ha, ah, I have two things that I want to say over and over again because I think repetition is what will stick. And if you're taking notes, write these down. And if you're not taking notes, write these down. Trust in his timing and trust in who he is. That's where we're going. John chapter 11. So at the very beginning, Lazarus was sick. He was not doing well. And so Lazarus's sisters, Mary and Martha, they were concerned. And so they sent a message to Jesus. Now, Jesus at the time was in, in a town that was about a day's journey away called Perea. And he was ministering and doing his thing that Jesus does awesome stuff when the carrier pigeon came and dropped down a note, he unrolled it and it says, the one whom you love is sick. Love Mary and Martha. So Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, they knew Jesus. They knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. They knew that Jesus knew Lazarus. So of course, if you, knew, if you know the dude who's like healing everyone and someone you love is sick, you're gonna be calling him because you're like, he can make a difference. So they give him a call and Jesus receives the note and he's just like, guys, let's pack up quick. You know, we're done here. I got to get on the fastest donkey to get to Bethany, to Judea, because Lazarus is there and I got to heal him. We got to go. Nope. That's actually not what happened. If you're following along or if you know the story, it's like he actually stayed where he was for two more days. He delayed. That's unusual. It's like, this is your buddy. Why aren't you running to help him? I mean, you have what it takes to heal him, so why the delay? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel that way with God. Why the delay? Why, why are you waiting to heal me? Why, why are you waiting to give me the job I need to provide for my family? Why are you waiting to make all things right? To get rid of this darkness altogether. You're the light of the world. You came. Why can't you just snuff it all out? And it's kind of encouraging that Jesus is, you know, like homeboy, like tight buddy Lazarus. Also did not experience express priority service from Jesus. So it's good to know God doesn't have favorites in case you're wondering if the person beside you got their healing after three days of prayer and you are three years in and still not experiencing that healing. That does not mean that God loves you less, that you haven't done enough or that somehow you don't measure up. That's not the way it works in his kingdom. He loves you desperately. Even when you feel like God isn't acting fast enough or right. But like Pastor Mike said last week when he preached about God being with us in the storms, that you don't experience the fullness of who God is without the storm. And that's the same with the darkness. Without the contrast, you don't realize what you're experiencing. We have to trust him. He has the bigger picture, that bigger perspective. We have this spotlight, which is that straight down spotlight, which is our life. And sometimes we can't see outside of that. But God actually sees everything lit up, like it's daylight everywhere. 
covers every space of your life, of everyone's life that you know. It is, he can see it all. And so we have to trust when we step forward that the light is going to continue to come through us and be with us. He sees it all and knows it all. So Jesus in the story, in verse, 11, or verse 4, he actually reassures his disciples, this sickness will not end in death, death for Lazarus, but will bring glory and praise to God. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. He could see the bigger story. Although he seemed to have misspoken in this moment of scripture, because it's like Lazarus does totally die. So he says it's not going to end in death. So I don't know where that goes, because it's like, well, that's not right. But he was perfect. He knew where he was going with the story. He was going to make all things right. It wasn't over yet. There is a bigger story. And spoiler alert, Jesus totally raises Lazarus from the dead. Like the guy dies and he raises him from the de dead. It's so awesome. If you haven't read the story, you should read the whole story, John chapter 11. But what we also have to remember is that Mary and Martha, the Jews, even the disciples that were mourning the death of Lazarus, even Jesus wept and he knew what was going to happen. It was very sad in that moment. But we have John chapter 12. So what is beautiful about our experience of where we are at right now is maybe you're sitting in John chapter 11, but 12 always comes after 11. It's so great that we can trust that we serve a God who sees what is coming. The story is not over yet. Your disappointment, your devastation, the death that you're experiencing in your own life it is not the end of the story. We need to trust in his timing and trust in who he is. Now, it's kind of cool because Jesus tells his disciples, okay, Lazarus is dead. And he's like, okay, we waited two days. Now we're going to head back to, to Bethany in Judea. And the disciples are kind of like, whoa, 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 do you remember Jesus? There is wanted posters all over that reason with, region with your face on it. Because everybody wanted to kill him in that region, which is why he fled. So now he wants to go back there because, you know, he wants to heal Lazarus. And they're like, no, 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 you totally shouldn't do that. And he, he explains something to them, which is so powerful. He says that my timing is what sets the tone. The, the darkness of man cannot dictate to the light when my time is up. Jesus has the authority over darkness. He decides. He says when he would have to die. He actually sets that timing. Like to even time your own time on this earth. It's so powerful. His timing is perfect. So he tells his disciples, yep, he, they're dead, he, or he's dead, Lazarus is dead. And then he says, for your sake, I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. So this is the God we serve. This is the light of the world. He does what he does for our benefit, so that we will believe in him, because he wants you to know him. And without that contrast, without that darkness, how, why would we trust and we have the breath, the word of God that says you can trust that all things work together for the good of those that love him. So if it's not good yet, it's not done yet. If there's no light yet, lean in and that darkness too shall pass. It is not done yet. In 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He wants every person who's drawing breath on this planet to know him, to actually know who he is, to know his light, so that when Jesus returns to, to complete the mission of restoring all things, that you will be a part of it, that I will be a part of it, that each one will know him and be able to experience no sickness, no pain, no death, no darkness forever. But there's a waiting period, which Jared's going to preach on next week. But we get to trust in his timing. 
So when Jesus makes his way to Bethany, they arrive and Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for four days. Now, four days is significant when we're thinking of timing and Jesus' impeccable timing because the Jews at that time actually believed that the spirit of a man could return to their body within the first three days of death. So if Jesus would have come and called Lazarus out of the tomb on day two, then they would have speculated, well, maybe the spirit returned to this man. But instead, he waited till day four. He waited until it was unquestionable that this was God. This was a miracle from God. This was God in the flesh. This is, I am revealing to you who I am. That's why he waited. Impeccable timing, your majesty. It doesn't feel like God's timing is so great. And that's how Martha, Martha feels. In John eleven twenty one. Martha says, Lord, if you had been there, been here, my brother would not have died. And I don't know about you, maybe you've had some of those if you had been there moments. I have. If you had been there to move that car out of the way, there wouldn't have been an accident and we would be together here today. If you had been there when my son got sick, I know we would have left the hospital. If you'd have been there, they wouldn't have abused me. If you'd have been there, you would have stopped it. If you would have been there before my marriage fell apart and I lost the kids, if you'd have been there before I lost my job and had to claim bankruptcy, you would have prevented it if you were there. If you can do all things, then why didn't you do what I needed you to do that I know you can do and that I've seen you do for others? That's how Martha is feeling. It's, she saw Jesus heal people. She saw them touch people's lives. So why the delay? Why didn't you show up and heal Lazarus? But this is what she says in verse 22. It's so good. But I know that even now, my God will give, or God will give you whatever you ask. She speaks in faith. She knows that he is good. That she just has to believe that this is the son of God. She has to believe in who he is, that even now, he can see what I can't. He can see past this addiction. He can see past this struggle. He can see past this broken relationship. He can see past this pain and suffering. He is with us. He was there when you were in the hospital. He was there when you lost that person you love. He was there in that accident. He was there and always will be there, weeping and waiting for that moment where he can restore all things, just like he did with Lazarus. That's the power of the stories in God's word is that we know that these things are possible this side of heaven. We know that the light has come into this world and we get to see light. We get to see things like we never saw them before. But there is also a greater completeness that is coming that we get to anticipate and, and encourage others that it's coming so that they can be a part of that amazing day. We just have to trust him, even when I don't see that miracle yet. When death is here and darkness seems everywhere, he is still the light. He is still your breakthrough. We trust in who he is. You know, Martha questions and doubts who Jesus is. And Jesus says to her, I am. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do I believe this? He is the light in our darkness. And she says, which should be our confession, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. He is the light that we are looking for, that breakthrough. Stephen Furtick, he's a powerful minister, and he says, you know, we keep trying to prove God's presence by what he does, but he just wants us to know who he is. We are meant to know him, to grow in intimacy with our Savior. You know, when we trust in God, we have, we have this divine anticipation. We have something to look forward to. We have a story that is so much bigger than huh, 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 where I am right now. We get to see beyond that and believe for the good to come. That he still keeps his province, promises, even when we don't see them on this side, on this earth. 
That intimacy with him, connection with him would be our goal so that we can see in a way that we couldn't before. You know, God wants us to trust him more than he wants us to be comfortable, which is challenging for a North American because often we equate God's favor with comfort. But the truth is, is that that is not it. Can I trust God when it's uncomfortable? Our, a beautiful team member in Edmonton, she had the privilege of going to South Africa and building a school and, and getting to visit you know, a, a family that was living in this eight by 10, tiny little house of metal, really. And she had this single bed, her and her three kids would share every night and they had you know, a little desk and, and some dishes and a hot plate. And I looked at her pictures and heard her story and I was just like, man, how is she going to feed her kids? How is she going to send them to school and clothe them and take care of them, let alone psychologically? I mean, just the physical level. And I was like, man, would I trust God if I didn't know where my next meal was coming from? Could I still believe that he is good even though I feel like it's the end of the world because someone just left, someone just hurt me? Can I still trust him? He is so good. Craig Rochelle in Hope in the Dark says, if you had everything figured out, you wouldn't need faith. You wouldn't need to trust God. You could simply live by your understanding, by your logic, by your skills, but not by faith. But when you don't understand something, that gives you the unique opportunity to deepen your faith. If you think that God has forgotten you, then you've forgotten who God is. He is so good. And the story of Lazarus, you know, it ends the way we want it to. It's like four days max, four days flat. That's what I want. It's like I prayed. It's done. It's healed. My body's healed. My marriage is healed. My kids are healed. It's all good. Four days. I can do four days. But the truth is, is can we still trust if we don't feel the way we want to, look the way we want to, have the life we've always wanted, and still trust that God is good? There will be death on this earth death of a dream, death of someone we love, but we know that it's not the end of the story. You know, we got to celebrate someone's life here in this auditorium, you know, about a month ago. And the, the thing that really hit me is that hope was screaming in this place, that there is something beyond this moment. There is a light in this darkness. There is still this beauty of what God is and how we can trust in him. James 1.17 says, every gift God freely gives us is good and it's perfect, streaming down from the Father of lights, the Father filled with light who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadow or darkness and is never subject to change. He actually pours that light into our lives. He brought the light of the world that we could experience his presence, that we could know him, and that we could be filled with that light in such a way that like it says in Matthew 5, 14, it says you, me, we are the light of the world. We are meant to shine before men that they would see the goodness of God and glorify the Father in heaven. Bring that glory back to him where it belongs. You know, endurance, living through things, being able to keep going is not just the ability to bear it, to bear hard things, but it's actually to turn it into glory. Not just hold on, but to actually be able to reflect and create a place where you experience things and people are like, what is wrong with you? How are you still walking in light? How are you still walking with joy? It's because there's a hope I have. And I want to share it. And I encourage you this morning, or I invite you to just stand to your feet. And we're going to pray this morning. We're going to pray a couple prayers of just, just saying, well, the second one of saying yes to Jesus. But right now, those of you who have followed Jesus, and maybe if this is new to you, then just lean in and listen. Because the thing about the light of the world is, is there's a hunger in God's people where they want to know more and, and be able to experience Him in a, in a bigger and a realer way. And so we lean into our Heavenly Father, and that's what we're going to do right now as His family. 
and I encourage you to just open your hands towards heaven in a, in a, a, in a posture of receiving from him that he is good and he wants to pour out his light in this season for you like never before. And we're just gonna receive that. I'd like to pray over you right now. God, I just thank you for your people. I thank you for that hunger that you've placed inside of us to know you more. God, that we would want to see what you see, God, that you would make things visible that we could not see before, that we will have perspective. We will have wisdom to make decisions. God, we will have light and joy to be able to share even with our families and our friends in this season, God, that we live in such a way that would reflect you. And I just thank you for your presence. I thank you for your Holy Spirit and that it would just pour on your people in a fresh and a new way right now that they would receive you, receive your good and perfect gifts, God, and know that you are good beyond a shadow of a doubt, not question that you are bringing the goodness to come. In your name, Jesus, amen. Amen. And we're going to pray one more prayer together. Awesome. We're going to pray one more prayer together of just saying yes to Jesus, of following him, of, of saying, you know what, I want that light. I want something that's beyond my here and now, beyond the darkness I'm feeling. I want to see the light like never before. So we're just going to pray this together. You can close your eyes and you can repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus, that you are the light of the world. Thank you that I can have hope because of you. I want my life to be forever connected to your story. I want your heart in me for others. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to thank you for your forgiveness. I want to thank you that you came to me. And now I'm saying yes to following you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We hope today's message encouraged you. If you want to take your next step in saying yes to Jesus, you can always contact us at cty.lc or fill out the next step section on the City Life app. It's an honor as a church to play just a small part in what God is doing in your life. We look forward to seeing you soon here at City Life.